So in 2002, Erin, who was completely healthy, went in for an outpatient hemorrhoidectomy, and they sent her home. And at that time, she had chills and fever, had a rapid heartbeat. I gave her some pain medication and said it was just a, a consequence of the surgery. The doctor showed up, and he was actually 12 hours late to see her, I said she had sepsis. Sepsis is the body's response to an infection or an injury, and it starts as an immune response that spins out of control. And now the organs, kidneys, lung, heart, liver, and brain, and other organs become damaged. These complications can be transient, short-lived, or they can become permanent and cause death. Aaron passed away from sepsis, and I had never heard the word sepsis. Unfortunately, the five doctors who were treating her seemingly didn't know much about it either. And the morning that she passed away, I was told there were lots of errands. I had no idea the amount of people dying. The death rate, the mortality from sepsis, is a staggering problem. Across the world, tens of millions of people die from severe sepsis every year. And within the United States, some 200,000 people or so die of severe sepsis annually. Rory had fallen and playing basketball in school, so he had cut his elbow just a, a little scrape. We took his temperature and it was very high. It was um, 104, so we decided to call the doctor. And by the time we were bringing him in, he uh, had gotten a lot weaker. From the time of the early signs of infection or injury to the time of organ failure and death can be as short as 12 to 24 hours. They did his tests and they took his blood and they came back and they said uh, he was being released and uh, that was it. We had absolutely no idea how sick he was at that point. There's a window of opportunity in which the early recognition that sepsis might be occurring or might occur can be prevented by administration of fluids, by administration of antibiotics, and by timely administration of oxygen. His nose began to turn black and we went right back into the hospital with him, into the emergency room. Doctors just started coming from everywhere and no one would look at me. Then he said his feet were cold. He said, Mom, my toes are cold, my toes are cold. He um, never spoke again. Never spoke again? Never. If you die of an infection, you die of sepsis. So if you die of pneumonia, the flu, a cut on your leg, anything like that and it's infected, you die of sepsis. They'd taken his blood, they'd taken the vitals, and now we found out that he had every one of the symptoms for sepsis. I'd never heard of the word beforehand. We didn't hear it in the hospital. We didn't hear it from the doctors. We never heard anyone use that word. No, never. So we've now learned that sepsis is the most common cause of death in most hospitals. So it would seem to me, if physicians want to save lives and monies for their hospital, they should think sepsis first and rule sepsis out. Why are people not ruling out sepsis first? Why, is, uh, why has it not happened? I have no clue. I have no clue. All I know is our son died, and all I know is he passed through many hands that night, and not one person said, could this be sepsis? Not one person. When Rory died, um, we made contact with Michael Downey, who is the, the chief executive officer of North Shore LIJ. I met the Stauntons soon after their son Rory passed away. Uh, they were introduced to me by a mutual friend. And he put together a group of his doctors to speak to us about sepsis. Every healthcare facility uh, you know, that wants to be focused on quality is always concerned about uh, mortality. Uh, and the bulk of mortality generally comes from infection. And so uh, I declared the policy quite a number of years ago that it wasn't good enough to have an X percentage of infection, it had to be zero. So it is really represents a culture change at every level of the organization that this disorder is recognized and treated aggressively as a life-threatening condition, even when the initial appearance may not be life-threatening. And we left those meetings feeling that we had been dealing with the gold standard on sepsis care because there is awareness throughout the health system on sepsis. For this to work, it requires universal awareness because the delivery of health care and the improvement of processes like this involve the administrators, the nurses, the doctors, the emergency medicine people, the whole constellation of individuals that have anything to do with the patient. 
the most exciting piece of this is that we have reduced the mortality rate for all patients in the health system presenting with sepsis by 50%. They cut sepsis fatalities by 50% over five years. So then we said, well, why can't that be done nationally? So we went to Congress and we had the first ever hearing, the Senate Health Committee on Health had hearings on sepsis. And then, of course, uh, they decided uh, that they wanted to, in many ways, you could say, lead a crusade so that it wouldn't be repeated uh, what happened to their son. At every angle we've gone to, we've had to force a door open. We've had to push it open. But yet then we find out that Carl Flatley went to all of those buildings 10 years ago. When I started this in 2002, I went to the CDC, I went to NIH, I went to Congress to find out who was keeping track of this, and no one was. Why is it left up to two people who've had to be tortured and to bury their son to take on a campaign? Shouldn't government be doing this? Aren't there government agencies out there protecting Americans? And my point is, well, what have they done since Aaron Flatley died? The biggest problem we have is no one's ever heard of sepsis. I mean, 60% of Americans have never heard the word sepsis. So the public does not put pressure on Congress or the CDC to help them. So here we are, 10, 12 years later, we've got millions of people that have died that shouldn't have. It's crucial that standard medical therapies for severe sepsis be adopted at hospitals across the country and across the world to save lives. If we just gave them antibiotics and fluids, we could save at least half of those lives. It's just a matter of early recognition and rapid treatment. And it also requires the commitment and the priority by government. Government has to say this is important. The CDC has to say this is what we are going to support and provide advice to. We are on board fully on this. This has to come from the top down. It shouldn't be coming from the suffering parents up. Nor sure LIJ should be the national template cutting fatalities by 50% from sepsis. I look forward to the day when we can quote that statistic nationally, but I hope we don't have to wait another 10 years. Rory was a big, blonde-haired kid, big blondie, but when he died, he was almost purple from head to toe. You couldn't recognize him. Rory Staunton's death was preventable and the thousands that come after them are preventable. Words cannot express how much you miss a child, especially when you know it was preventable. And sepsis is preventable.